Harry Cambron, Pete Aramospe, and John Lashagay were uncomfortable, apprehensive, as they headed their horses south from Eagleville, California, on January 16, 1911. It had been a long, severe winter, and the weather on this day was no exception. It was bitter cold. Gloved hands froze to the horse's reins. The three men were headed toward the high desert country of northern Nevada to check on their livestock and herders. But it wasn't just the bad weather that concerned them. Recently, there had been ominous reports that a marauding band of Indians was slaughtering livestock in that area. An investigation was needed, and soon, despite the weather, the three men spurred their horses northward into the freezing wind. At Denial's Ranch, some 50 miles from Eagleville, a buckaroo by the name of Bert Indiano joined the party. All four men were provisioned to stand the inhumanly cold temperatures. But Harry Cameron had something more. Cameron carried a small 32 caliber pistol. Three days later, the four men rode into the Little Rock Canyon some 40 miles north of Gerlach, Nevada. Waiting in ambush were Shoshone Mike and a small band of his followers. A few heartbeats later, the four white men lay dead. News of the ambush swept Nevada like the winter wind, and the accounts of the savageness of the massacre were frightening. The faces of all four men had been mutilated, torn apart for their gold teeth. Their lifeless bodies had been stripped of their clothing, then thrown carelessly into the deepening snow. Quickly, enraged whites took up arms. Posses were formed throughout northern Nevada and California, in Washoe, Humboldt, and Elko counties, and in Modoc County, California. The families of the murdered men offered rewards for the capture of the perpetrators. On February 17, 1911, Nevada Governor Tasker Audit up the ante. He signed legislation authorizing an additional reward of $5,000 for the capture of the criminals. One band of men, 18 strong, took up the trail at Little High Rock Canyon. Included in the group were Captain Donnelly, superintendent of the Nevada State Police, an Indian tracker, and a number of seasoned buckaroos. As the trail stretched further into the Nevada desert, spirits soared. It appeared that the Indians were unaware that they were being followed. The posse picked up the pace. Shoshone Mike was not proud of the ambush. It had not been a great battle like the battles of old, but an act of desperation. Defeated and displaced by the white settlers, the Shoshone were forced to forsake their hunting grounds and remain constantly on the move. This winter had been no exception. Shoshone Mike's small group of men, women, and children were suffering greatly from the bitter cold. Taking food and clothing by force, if necessary, seemed the only alternative to exposure, starvation, and death. It wasn't long before the Shoshone realized that they were being followed, and Shoshone Mike urged his people onward. He knew the one chance of survival lay in reaching the western Shoshone Indian Reservation in northeastern Elko County before the posse could overtake them. His only hope lay with the weather. Perhaps the white men would be forced to turn back. But Shoshone Mike had underestimated the determination of the settlers. Through driving hail, ice, sleet, snow, and sub-zero weather, the men pushed on through one of the worst winters on record. For 16 numbing days, the men lived in their saddles, catching a little sleep or hot food at now abandoned ranches. It was almost noon, Sunday, February 26, as the posse rode slowly through a light snowstorm near Rabbit Creek. Through the swirling flecks of white, they suddenly came upon the Indian camp in a shallow sagebrush draw. Quickly, the men dismounted. Numb fingers groped wildly for their guns. As the posse scrambled for position, the Indian camp erupted with gunfire. In the fierce fighting that followed, Indian women fought side by side with their men. Children brandished ungainly weapons and sought cover. When their ammunition ran out, bows and arrows appeared. In desperation, the Indians fashioned crude spears lashed onto broom handles. It was all to no avail. 
as the tide of battle turned against the followers of Shoshon Mike, Indian women painted their faces and per performed a sort of death chant as the heavy fire from the posse cut them down. Silence fell over the canyon. Snow drifted gently down on the carnage. Only four Indian children remained alive. The posse had suffered but one casualty. Their grim mission accomplished, the white men turned their horses for home. Ironically, they were unaware that they had earned not merely a small reward from the families of the deceased ranchers, but Governor Adi's 5,000 as well. They had already been in the saddle seven days when the additional reward had been posted. Exhausted, the posse members returned to their homes, claimed the rewards from the families of the dead men, and were promptly paid. But ironically, the state of Nevada refused to honor its own $5,000 reward. Officials claimed that the posse was not entitled to the money, for it was posted only after they had rode out in pursuit of the Indians, and therefore they could have had no knowledge of it. In addition, the state claimed that the reward had been offered for the arrest and conviction of the perpetrators, not dead or alive. In the ensuing litigation, Ormsby County District Court Judge Frank Langan agreed with the posse members. The men had earned the money, he suggested, and ordered the state to pay up. But dissatisfied with the district court's ruling, Attorney General George Thatcher referred the matter to the Nevada Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled for the posse. In an opinion written by Chief Justice Norcross, the court reasoned that the reward had been authorized by the legislature, and as every citizen is presumed to know the law, the members of the posse didn't need actual knowledge of the reward in order to claim it. It further concluded that because the Indians had been killed while resisting arrest, the conditions of the reward had been substantially complied with. The trial's court order awarding the reward to the posse was affirmed. The Supreme Court having rendered its decision, the posse disbanded. Shosho and Mike and his small band were no more. No one knows what became of the four Indian children who survived that final attack. One, a daughter of Shosho and Mike himself. Nonetheless, Indian and white alike, they took their place in Nevada history. That final confrontation on February 26, 1911, was the last Indian battle in America.